Little Catherine's plea for help and for hope from Santa Claus was common during the Great Depression, but it was not new. Santa Claus was inspired by St. Nicholas, a 4th century bishop from Myra, and patron saint of children and the poor. Tales speak of his generosity, giving gifts in secret, one such hidden gift landing inside stockings hung by the fire to dry. By the 1100s, French nuns began giving candy and gifts to needy children on St. Nicholas Day, celebrated not on Christmas Eve, but December 6th. And so, as immigrants arrived on the shores of New York, they brought not just their dreams and hopes for the new world, but also the traditions of who might help them in their journey. It was a poem in 1822 by New York professor Clement Clark Moore that transformed St. Nicholas, or Cinder Claus, into his American successor. Instead of a tall, stoic man, for the first time we learned of an impish elf with rosy cheeks, twinkling eyes, and a little round belly, with a sleigh full of toys and his eight flying reindeer. Famed illustrator Thomas Nast unveiled more of Santa's magic, drawing detailed scenes showing for the first time Santa's list of good children, his workshop where he built toys, and his Christmas Eve flight. Back in Indiana, in 1852, when the little town of Santa Fe learned it must change its name in order to get a new post office, it's no wonder what the town lore says. A little girl, upon hearing the sound of sleigh bells outside the town meeting, proclaimed it's Santa Claus. The application was resubmitted, the post office was approved, and the first Santa Claus town in the world came to be. A decade later, Thomas Nast revealed the location of Santa's home in Santa Clausville, North Pole. For the first time, children knew how to write him, and write they did. By the turn of the century, the United States Postal Department was under pressure by the press and public. Couldn't they find some way to get these letters, filled with the hopes and wishes of children into the hands of Santa's helpers? In response, in 1912, the department approved a new rule. Local postmasters could allow community elves to answer these letters. And soon after, it instituted the courtesy custom of forwarding letters addressed to Santa Claus to the small southern town of Santa Claus, Indiana. As Santa's popularity grew, so too did the town's recognition. And it was that recognition during World War I that forever changed the future of Santa Claus. My father was Raymond Joseph Yelling, really strange German name, not many of them in the world anymore. And he was born in Mariah Hill, Indiana, and joined the United States Navy as a very young, young man. But while he was in the Navy, he was at Brooklyn Navy Yard. So at Christmas time, the sailors decided they wanted to have a Christmas party for children. Sailor said, Jim, you know, you say you're from Santa Claus. Would you like to help us out for, these, for this party and be Santa Claus for these children? And he said, it was absolutely just most wonderful experience. He said, when I see the children, when I see them smile, when I see their wonder, that makes it all worthwhile. And he said, I made the uh, promise to myself that if I lived through World War I, I would do this. I would be Santa Claus. After surviving World War I and retiring from the Navy, Ulick married his childhood sweetheart, Isabella, and moved back to Santa Claus, Indiana. For Postmaster Martin, the additional Santa helper came at the perfect time. By 1929, the tiny town received nearly 100,000 letters a year. Indiana Congressman Harry Rowbottom proposed a U.S. bill to raise the Postmaster's salary for all his efforts. Upon reading the proposal, Robert Ripley, of Ripley's Believe It or Not, was astonished to learn there was a Santa Claus and shared it with the world through his popular cartoon. By next Christmas, the town received over one million letters. Ulick and his wife organized the first team of Santa helpers. The elves had come to Santa Claus. 